recording live. Excellent. Welcome everyone to session nine open results of the Nebula program. This is the last week of the official training before the graduation weeks. Is that right, Irene? Yeah, you haven't like shaken your head in horror, so I didn't say anything completely wrong. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to go through our usual reminders and then we're going to kick off the call with our expert. Uh, so, um, as always, this call is recorded and transcribed. Um, so you can click on the Otter AI transcription. The link to that is in the Etherpad or on the top left of the screen if you're on Zoom where it says Otter AI. Um, and that can allow you to follow along um, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, but it does its best uh, <laughs> what we've been saying. Um, we will have some breakout activities in this call. So as always, we ask people to add W in front of their name if they prefer to interact with other people via writing or S in front of your name if you prefer to interact by speaking. Um, we have a code of conduct, the ways to report if anything hasn't gone well that you believe um, shouldn't continue to happen. In lines 37 and 38 on the Etherpad, email team at we-r-ols.org or any of the individual team members. For example, if I was very, very mean and you needed to tell someone, you could email Malvika about that. Um, I think that's everything except for Irene's recap. So Irene, I shall pass the baton. Thank you, Joe. I'm gonna share my slides really quickly and um... Yes. Can you see that? Okay, so we are in week five. And as Joe said, we are um, in the module of results, open results. And today in particular, we're going to learn about um, what, you know, research outputs across the, um, um, research life cycle, not just at the end, but throughout all of it. Um, and we're gonna le learn a little bit about reproducibility and how this is connected to uh, research outputs from beginning to end. Um, and also about contribution guidelines and giving recognition in open projects. So again, this week is the, we are gonna have our last training sessions but you are all continuing with your coaching sessions. And as we have mentioned in, in the past, um, last week, we are offering an extension of two weeks just for everyone to have the opportunity to finish the coaching sessions and also to have the project presentations. Um, again, we're gonna share this information in detail by email, but I wanted to take some minutes to um, go through the changes. Um, so we are in week five, we're gonna have our usual cohort calls uh, today and on Thursday. Um, and then in, in week six and week seven, uh, we want to hear it from you. We want to hear what you have learned, um, what connections you have identified between your work and open science, and what are your next steps. Um, and for that, we're gonna have um, only one session uh, in week six and in week seven, uh, one group session. Um, your calendars invites should be already updated with that. And so in week six, we're gonna have um, a group session on Thursday. So the Tuesday session, uh, we're no longer gonna have that. And then, because we know that some people prefer an earlier time and to give everyone the, the chance to present their project, on week seven, we're gonna have Tuesday session at an earlier time. I think that's gonna be at 12, uh, 12 p.m. Um, at UTC. So that's um, six hours earlier. Um, just because we have heard that uh, an earlier time might work for people and we want to give everyone, you know, the space to present that um, and to join. So, and on week eight, we are going to have just a goodbye session. Um, again, on Tuesday, that's just going to be one hour. That's not going to be recorded. It's just for everyone to join, come and share um, what you liked 
um, and to say goodbye as well. So another reminder um, about the project presentations. I know that people have been asking a lot of questions. Um, and I would like to encourage people to um, use the space to share what you have learned. It's not going to be like an exam or anything. It's really just, we want to hear from you and we want to um, everyone to learn from you what you have worked on. And again, what are your plans for the next steps? The main requirement for the presentation is that you keep it under five minutes. That's a very short time. Um, and one reason for that is that um, it's really a casual presentation. So it's not a long project presentation. We just want to um, learn from you in, in this space. Again, all of this information, uh, you're gonna receive this by email. And as I was saying that um, we have been hearing that some people could prefer to uh, join at an earlier time. And so we're gonna have two groups, um, people who will present on week six and people who will present on week seven. And in the email, you will have um, a link to a spreadsheet where you are going to sign in with your name and to choose on which week you want to present. And if you are unsure about what to include in your presentation, um, ask your coach, they will be able to guide you um, and to give you feedback on what you want to present. But again, main requirement, keep it under five minutes and um, it's, it's very casual. Please don't stress about it. If you have any questions, um, write me or um, write in the Slack and we will answer there. So those are the few announcements before we start. And um, I think with that, we can start the presentation. Um, I think, Joe, can I pass it over to you to introduce Monica? Fantastic. I'm really, really happy that we have Monica with us today. Uh, so Monica has been mentoring um, open. <laughs> Sorry, I'm seeing I'm seeing mentor mentee waves happen there and I get a little bit excited then. Um, yeah, Monica has been mentoring open uh, science and open technology related projects for as long as I've known her. I think I first, we first met probably 2017 at Mozilla Festival, I'm going to say. Um, and we're really, really excited to see what you have to share today, Monica. Take it away. Thanks so much, Yo. Uh, and hi, everybody. I'm so glad to get to speak to all of you today. Um, my name is Monica Granados. Um, I am an assistant director at Creative Commons. It's the nonprofit that stewards the licenses that are used and a lot of the materials that you're using in um, in the Nebula cohort. Um, I'm also um, on the leadership team and a co-founder of Pre-Review. Um, you'll get to meet my colleague later this week as well. She's going to go into more about preprints and, and publications. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is really an introduction to open results. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, I think it's that there's just been a lot of focus on scientific publications as the only medium by which we communicate uh, information about research or, or knowledge products. And I, I want to think about what, what are the pathways to get to that research and how can we open up the different segments of that pathway so that we can share more about the research life cycle and really increase the transparency and ultimately the reproducibility of the work that we do. So in the uh, notepad, you'll see that there's the slides that I'll be presenting. Um, saw a really neat presentation at the, um, the NASA Open Science Conference that it's really helpful to share your slides ahead of time so that people that use screen readers or that use assistive devices can have, uh, can sort of follow along as you're presenting. So I share that with you as something that I recommend that other folks do. I thought that that was, um, it was a really great learning experience for me. Okay, so let's get to the slides. Okay, so uh, 
when I was a policy advisor at Environment and Climate Change Canada, I got to work on this really neat project where we were making a book about open science for elementary school kids. And it asked a really interesting question. So in the story, uh, Celia is fishing. So she could see that in, in that sort of like first image, she's fishing and she gets a bite on her, uh, on her, her line and she pulls up a fish. And she's like, this is a really neat fish. I've never seen something like this before. I'm gonna take it home and study it. So she takes it home and she just starts to like write down information about the fish, how long it is, what color it is, what kind of behavior it has, like does it sleep at night or does it sleep in the day? And she is so excited about it that she wants to present it to her class. And this whole story is, uh, you can follow along in that story after the presentation in the link in the notepad or on the slides. Um, it's entitled uh, Becoming Junior Scientists. And the question that Celia asks is, you know, I really want to tell people about this new discovery that I made. How do I tell people about it? How do scientists tell people about their discoveries? And I think that's a really interesting question to ask kids because that's sort of a very granular detail that they normally don't really hear about or learn about. But I think it's a really interesting question to even ask ourselves is when we work on understanding uh, a, a process or, a, or get a mechanistic understanding of something, how do we communicate the results? And for the most part, if you are in an academia, or even if you're like in industry or in a nonprofit, for the most part, you're going to be presenting it into in a scientific publication or a research publication. So a, a, a peer reviewed paper at the end. So, you know, she meets with uh, a scientist who uh, just happens to look like me. Um, I had this awesome illustrator that worked with us at Environment and Climate Change Canada by the name of Dominic Lean. And so she draws, you know, the picture of, of me explaining to Celia that, you know, we present our results via this manuscript, the scientific paper that gets reviewed by other scientists. Some changes get to be made that then gets sort of sent out through um, through libraries. And then the idea is that then that gets percolated out to, um, to, to sort of knowledge dissemination to, you know, to policymakers, to doctors. Um, except that we know here that there's a really big challenge from getting to that scientific publication or that research publication to actually disseminating that research. But the point of the story is that that is, that's the like medium of communication is this scientific or research publication. And, and I think there's something that we should really think about and challenge a, about that being the way that we disseminate information. That when researchers find something new, it gets put into this like two dimensional paper that often can't be read, read by most people either because they don't have physical access to it. It's in the an academic language that most uh, lay persons can't understand, or perhaps it's even in the language that most that that, you know, most of the world can't read. Science and research is, is very much an English language uh, process or practice, and that limits uh, the accessibility of that. But the path to getting to that final publication uh, is long and arduous. If any of you have done any research, you know that it's not like Celia who like finds a fish and then she publishes a paper about it. Um, there's a lot of steps involved. And what I want to, you folks to first think about is um, 
what are the steps to get to a publication? Um, so this is one of our first activities. I want you to think about what kind of processes need to take place to start from really the idea of like a new idea or a new discovery, like the one that say makes, to having that version of record or that final publication, which is sort of the way that researchers disseminate knowledge. So I'm going to get everybody to um, go to the link in the activity number one, and you're going to each go to a breakout room and pick the timeline that corresponds to your breakout room. And I want you folks in your group to think about what are the different segments? Like what are the different pieces that I need? And often chronologically that I need to finally get to a publication. What are the pieces of information that I need or processes that I have to go through to get to a publication. Okay, how do we play in this mirror board? So what I like about this mirror board is that it's gonna let us all sort of work in that same space. And once you find your timeline for your group, all you have to do is um, like double click the, the question mark blank like this and you could input um, text. So for example, if I, one of the things that you, you know will probably come up is that you're gonna need some data. So put data as one of your pieces, then you know what's what else do you I need? Once I collect data, what's the next thing that I'm gonna need before I can move to the next step so that I can finally get to uh, disseminating my information in a research publication. So we've got the guidelines and the prompts in the notepad. So the first thing to do is you're going to designate a recorder so that one person um, from each group is inputting the suggestions from the group. Um, you're going to do it on the mirror board. So you're going to each, each group gets its own little timeline. You'll fill in the blanks and then we'll come back um, as a group and look at what people uh, found uh, in similarity and what people found in terms of like that others did not find or, or think are necessary ingredients to get to that publication. Any questions? Okay, I'll turn it over to Edina to, oh, there's a question perhaps. Hi, hi, Monica. I'm Anna. <laughs> Monica, in law researches uh, and publications, uh, I think I think we think a little bit different because I was thinking about a theme, a problem, an hypothesis, a methodology, and uh, that. So I, I I don't think I don't think it's the same. Um, Oh, but that's fine. That's what we want to see. We want to see that what the differences are, even in different disciplines. In different and areas. I, ah, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. It doesn't have to be the scientific discipline. It could be social science. It could be humanities. And from there, we'll we'll pull out sort of higher level, um, what we're going to call call uh, research objects that we'll talk uh, about more during the rest of the session. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, so I, I could understand. Thank you. Yes, yes. So feel free to feel free to, to, to sort of take a different disciplinary perspective. Okay, okay. thank you, Monica. So um, I'm gonna open the breakout rooms. You have 10 minutes and um, all the instructions are in the notepad if you need. Um, you know, to orient yourself around the mirror board and the exercise. Um, if you haven't um, changed your name to include a W or an S, please do that and I will move you to the right breakout room. So they are now open and you should be able to join. I think we're all back. We're all back. 
Oh, it's okay if you're not done. We can, we'll, uh, we'll walk through what you found. And like I said, it'll be interesting to see like what different um, folks think. And the answer is like, it's gonna be subjective, right? Not only it's gonna be subjective depending on the discipline, um, it, it, it w some paths will be a little bit more convoluted than, than others as well. Um, let's see what everybody found. Okay, great. So, all right. So I'm looking at, I'll just go sort of in, in, uh, in order um, or in um, ascending order. So room, no, so room number one, you folks put down identifying the research gap, uh, perfect sort of answering or asking the question. You've got to collect the data, then you draft the manuscript. Um, then you you submit it and you uh, will review it depending on how once you submit it to a journal for publication you it will get reviewed and uh, once it's reviewed unless you get really lucky most of the times it's going to come back and you're going to have to do revisions and like send it back and this is what I mean by convoluted uh, you know I've had research papers where like I submitted it it got you know, some revisions and then it got rejected. Then I had to submit it to another journal and then you go through that same process. So it can be very convoluted, at least, even in that just stage of the submission and review, right? Like you could have multiple cycles in there. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good overview. Um, let's see, what did room two find? So room two like has more detail here. So let's, uh, let's just zoom in a bit. What we've got here. All right, so you start with your um, defining the problem. It's very similar to what room one found. Um, I saw this, the defining the methodology. I think that was, that's interesting. I think that that was something that wasn't mentioned in room one is that that you probably have to also figure out like once you have the, the, the problem, like how do you ask the question about the problem? You know, this is where we get into like experimental design and whether, regardless of what discipline, you know, it could be like, how many different beakers do I have and how many treatments do I have to like, how many subjects do I need for my, um, my experiment in psychology? Then you do, yeah, the data collection. So like using, following that methodology, you're gonna be collecting that data. Again, it could be like measuring the temperature of each beaker. It could be measuring the reaction of each participant in your, uh, in your experiment. Um, you're gonna then analyze the data. So I like how you split that up from collecting the, the data to also then analyzing the data. And you've got a couple, I really like how you split this up. Um, you are going to prepare the publication. You're going to you're going to draft it up. Maybe maybe you have like a, a version of that manuscript that's in a in a in a doc, you know, in like a uh, in a word document or some kind of word processing equivalent. So that's where you're going to be typing it up. Then you do all these questions about like, yeah, where should I publish it? who is this like what's the what's the audience um that probably is like linked to what the channel is um and then yeah that peer review process that was identified in group one which is that cycle of submit and review um awesome let's look at room three uh it's very similar to to room one so you've got the research idea generation uh data collection writing and peer review then the acceptance, I like that, the acceptance, which is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, very exciting when you finally get that email that says, congratulations, we've accepted your manuscript, because it has to be accepted um, before it gets put on the journal website. Um, and even then, there's still like some little steps in between the acceptance and the version of record, right? Because you have to go over proofs, and you have to make sure that everything's spelled right. It is a very long process. Um, let me make sure we also see the last one up here. Room number four, you've got data collection, data description, 
data analysis, I like this like real focus on the data part uh, and writing, writing over and over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the What your article looks like at the beginning of the writing process and what it looks like at the end um, can be very different with the idea that usually, you know, you hope that the peer review process is improving your manuscript. So I think we've got um, a really good overview of like what this process is, is, is like. So, okay, so what are some of, so as we take all of this input in, what are the high level uh, categories? And to think about this, I want you to remember that this is a construct, right? The, this like research life cycle is a contract in the sense that like it's a model for us to follow because as we're gonna talk about later, when we have a conceptual model of what that research process is like, it's going to let us split it into pieces. And then we can look at each one of those pieces in the research life cycle and look at, are there ways in which we can open this segment of the research cycle? So that we're not just thinking about opening up the paper, but opening up every segment of that research life cycle. So the first is the ideation. I think that that was mentioned in room number one. Ideation being the planning of the project, or even if just the idea of the project. Um, many disciplines actually require you to put together a project proposal. If you've ever done um, academic research, you usually have to put together a project proposal for your graduate thesis. Um, so ideation is probably that first big one, thinking about the idea. The next one is the methodology, thinking about, okay, well, now that I have my question, what's the methodology? Like, how am I going to go in and test this question? What, what's the methods I'm going to use to test my hypothesis or test the question that I am interested in? You'll then move into a collection of that data. So, you, you're following the methodology that you stipulated, you're going to collect a bunch of data, and then you're going to analyze that data. Like the next one is sort of that data analysis segment. Once you've analyzed that data, you're going to do, you're going to write up your manuscript. There's going to be that peer review process. There's going to be, and then the publication of the paper. So in a very high level sense, again, as a construct, that's the research life cycle ideation, uh, methodology, data collection and analysis, and then the publication process or the, you know, the, the knowledge dissemination process. So I want you to think about sort of that construct again, because now that we've got these different pieces, we can think about how we can open each one of those. But what happens if the pathway to publication is, is not open? What happens if each in, in each one of those steps, the only thing we think about is maybe thinking about how we open that last segment? How do we open up research publications? If we if we keep everything else closed, if we keep our our ideation, our data collection and analysis, our methodology, and the peer review process all closed what can happen? Well, it turns out that's exactly sort of what we generally do in academia. Most of those research segments are closed. There's been a lot of focus on opening up publications and increasingly more on, on open data, but for the most part, the like, you know, what, makes up the pieces of that publication is closed. And a lot of the times you may understand why, like I think the research publication is the currency that is used by researchers to get jobs, to get promoted, uh, to get scholarships, to get um, like, you know, uh, research opportunities. And so you think, think, well, if I keep this process closed, if I don't open my data, if I don't open the peer review process, if I don't open, I can, I can keep all of this to myself. And then there's more of a chance that I'll be able to use the publication just for myself. 
And that's what happens. That's what happens in across all disciplines. And the consequences of that is what we call the reproducibility crisis. It means that in many cases, researchers who have performed an experiment and have shown a specific result, you know, let's take a, a let's take an innocuous example. You perform a uh, an experiment where you're trying to find out if people who live in Ottawa like Coke more or like Pepsi more, and you find an overwhelmingly uh, uh, advantage or preference for Coke. Great, you publish this paper, amazing. Coca-Cola buys a stadium in Ottawa because they know that people really like Coca-Cola. And you run the experiment again. And you find this time that there's no difference. There's no difference in the preference between Coke and Pepsi. And this happens in sort of a micro scale very often in science. We, uh, in 2000 and 16 survey on reproducibility found that of the researchers they surveyed, more than 70% of those could not reproduce their own experiment, let alone someone else's experiment. They could not reproduce their own experiment. And this is a really big problem because it not only makes you cautious about what scientists are saying, or even in your own results. But I think it fuels a distrust in science or research or knowledge production in general. There's been many cases of this happening. And so especially to the public who are looking to these knowledge producers to give them information about how the world works, or a disease, or an affliction, or climate change, that if you can't reproduce those results, then is the science real? Are those differences I'm finding in my treatments or time series real? And I think that fuels a lot of distrust in science and really can slow down the progress of science and our understanding of problems. But the good news is that when we open up that pathway, that research cycle, that it's then easier to find mistakes, to have people look and give feedback on each stage of the research cycle so that mistakes can be found, so that more data can be collected, so that we can reduce this reproducibility crisis because we're just gonna make science better. We're gonna make the process of research better. So, how do we do that? How can we open up each of the segments of the research life cycle, not only so that uh, we can, it can be beneficial to us so that we have collaborators that can come work with us or like check our data or give input on our manuscript, but I think in general, just to improve the knowledge production pathway and ultimately like trust in knowledge production. So how do we make open results? So I'm gonna go through a couple of the pieces of what we're calling uh, these like research outputs and giving you examples of technology or initiatives that the research community has created to open up these segments of the research life cycle. Okay, so what's the first? So we talked about uh, ideation and like data collection. When I first learned uh, how to do science as a, an ecologist, most of it, uh, at least in, my, in like my master's was collected on pieces of paper. Like we would go out to the boat and measure like the length of fish and we would record the, how big that fish was on like a piece of paper. And so at the end of the, the field season, we had just the big stacks of pieces of paper. That's not very accessible, unless you know me and you could come to my office and read my, my piece of paper. And then you'd also hope that you could read my handwriting. So it's not 
it's not a very accessible, it's not a very open way to collect data. So a couple of initiatives that have looked at how do we open up that like ideation data collection section of the research life cycle are the following. So the first is uh, the op Open Lab Notebooks. It's uh, an initiative out of the Structural Genomics Consortium. They're in the UK and in Canada. And what they do is actually put all their data online, like their actual notebooks. So instead of like writing down, you know, how long the fish is or whether your, you know, your mouse um, reacted to a treatment in like an actual notebook, they go online and they have a digital notebook that they upload this information to. And they do it every day or every week. So you get sort of a live feed of that data. Protocols.io um, is a service uh, at the time it was a non, I think it was a, a smaller project. Now I think it's part of a, of a larger um, like publication organization, but what they do is really cool. And what it is, is a website where you can upload your methodology. So instead of putting your results or your methodology again on a piece of paper or on like a paper notebook, online you say, this is step one of my treatment, right? So if I'm, again, let's go back to the Coke and Pepsi example. So you would write, I collect, I surveyed 1,000 people. I asked the que I asked this question. This is what the survey looked like. So you give step by step, like a recipe. So it's really like if you go to, you know, Home and Garden magazine and you're looking up a recipe for how to make bread, it gives you the exact steps for how to make the bread. This is a recipe for how to do the experiment. So you upload your information of how you did that experiment and step-by-step step it tells you how to um, perform that specific experiment. And anyone can look at it or anyone can read it so that they can see the experiment that you're doing or the experiment that you did. A couple of disciplines also use Jupyter notebooks. So, so the reproducible notebooks where you actually write out all of the code for your experiments, every single step in the process, and the notebook can actually then produce the manuscript. So every, so not only does it have the steps of the experiment, it has the code, and then it um, has the text that's associated with the, man, the, the manuscript associated with your experiment. So here are just three examples of how you can move from a very not accessible notebook to a much more transparent and at times reproducible way of your data collection and your writing out your methodology. Once you've, you've collected that data, we talked, the next part is where do you store that data? So uh, when I was in my master's, um, my supervisor had all of his data from like his thesis and sort of prior research on punch cards. So they, these were these like, it's an old media from like the seventies where instead of writing information onto a hard drive or a floppy disk, which probably precedes many of you, and I had a couple of floppy disks in, in, in college, um, the media before that were these like cards with like holes cut out and you could store information on these cards. Really what we use now for the most part, at least on our computers are these hard drives. But if the hard drive is sitting on my desk, no one else can read that. The only people who could read the, uh, the hard drive are people who could come to my office or who could come to my desk. So how do we open up that segment of the research life cycle? Data depositories or data repositories. There is a very extensive worldwide network of different types of 
data depository, uh, repositories where once you've collected your data and it's maybe as a CSV file on your computer or a data frame of some kind, you can upload it to the internet so that other people can use that data or even look at patterns in your data. There are anecdotes of researchers who are working on similar questions, finding data from those from, you know, the other researchers working on that same problem and analyzing their data and finding different patterns of that data. There's also anecdotes of uh, researchers finding fake data, right? So researchers will upload their data to data repositories, the data is fake or it's been manipulated and other researchers who are looking for data fraud will find this open data and find the statistical anomalies in the data and be able to detect data fraud. And, and you can then sort of connect how that's related to data reproducibility because these data sleuths are finding fraud, which is very generally pretty rare, but this is a way for people to catch fraud as well. So the place I like to point people to, to find a data repository that might work for you is this r3data.org. It's a, um, it's a it consolidates um, information about all the different types of data repositories out there in the world. You can actually use their tool. The little GIF there is walking through what the tool um, interface is like so that you actually can find a repository for your specific discipline. So I know there's a couple of uh, participants um, here who are in law and social science. So you might wanna be looking for a different repository than someone who is studying frogs. Um, so you could go and look at that specific, the specific discipline that you're looking for through this like, this like, um, graphical user interface and find a repository that works for you. There's also a lot of general repositories that will take data from any discipline. Okay, a couple, a couple of other groups pointed out that, um, you know, we also have to analyze the data. So we've, we've ideated, we've done the methodology, we've collected the data, now we have to analyze it. So even if the data is um, on the cloud or somewhere on the internet, how you analyze that data can be very different because um, the data frame is just a data frame until you make a pattern or a story from that. And if you wanna tell the people how you analyze that data, you wanna put out uh, potentially the code or the process or the steps you took to move from a simple data frame that just has columns and rows of observations to the patterns that you might've observed in that data frame. So what are some tools that have been developed to help us open up that segment? One is this frictionless data tool. So this is an initiative from the Open Knowledge Foundation. What the frictionless data tool allows you to do is to upload your CSV file or your data frame, and then put information about your data. So like information about like, what is what does the column headings mean? What do the row headings mean? Um, it will, you can also um, give information about the entire data frame. You also can use a tool like either the Jupyter Notebooks or the R statistical programming language, which is very popular in ecology, which is the the discipline that I'm trained in. And what the R statistical programming language does is that instead of going, for example, if you're on an Excel spreadsheet and you know, you're know you trying to find the sum of an average uh, across a couple of your columns in your data frame. So instead of like doing the dragging uh, to find that information, you do it programmatically. So you do it with code. What's really nice about doing it with code is that if your data frame changes, you just have to rerun the code, like the code is saved, 
you change the data frame, you just hit literally a button that says rerun, and it will then output the new value based on your changed data frame. And then that saved code can be put online on something like GitHub, because I know you folks have learned about GitHub, as that's a, that's a uh, programming like repository, a code repository, and other people can then use your code for either their own data or your data. So for example, for my PhD, I have all the code that I use to analyze my data on GitHub so that if somebody wanted to go in and use my analysis or even just rerun the analysis that I did on my specific data, they could do that because it's all online. It's all transparent. And then finally, there's that piece of the, of the scientific publication. I'm going to go over it sort of very high level because my colleague Danny's going to go through it uh, with more detail. But there's a lot of ways to make that last bit, the scientific publication, more accessible so that people don't hit a paywall and have to pay $99 or $9 for 12 hours to read the research that you produced. There's the uh, availability of preprints of so the version of the manuscript before it's gone uh, through peer review that you can post so that everyone can read and then give feedback on. So what this shows is that even the peer review process can be opened. The options like green open access, which allows you to put a version of that manuscript that's already been through peer review into a repository that your institution might have or a general repository. And there's this uh, option of also diamond open access, which is increasingly becoming more and more popular, which is just like any other journal, um, except that you don't have to pay to make it open and someone doesn't have to pay to read it. Again, you're gonna hear a little bit more about this, um, at, um, I think Thursday on, at your next class, but this is to show that what I want you to take from, from this is that every segment of that research life cycle can be opened, not just this last piece. And the reality is, is that like, it's not only really helpful for the reproducibility crisis, for trust in research, but it's also super helpful as someone who is doing research yourself um, because it just gets more eyeballs on it. 66% um, of researchers have found, have a citation advantage when they, when they publish this open access. And the papers, research papers that have um, a link to the data actually also have uh, show an, a citation advantage. So that if you have a link to the actual data in your publication that's open, you actually also get a citation advantage so that more people actually cite your paper when you've got open data associated with your publication. So let's move on to our second activity. I want you to think about so I gave you some examples of open method, open methods, uh, open data, open data analysis, open access, but I want you to go and find more examples. So um, what I've done is just put together a simple data uh, frame here or, or like a spreadsheet. And what I want you to do is again, we're gonna break out into groups on activity two. And to find other examples that maybe we didn't talk about today, um, you can even go back and look at your notes here in the mirror board and see, let's see, let's, what's an example that we didn't uh, look at? Um, we've got a couple of, of people here that wrote around ideation. We didn't really talk about ideation. So we've got hypothesis, um, this idea of like involving like community review. Can you find examples of the open community or infrastructure that's already out there to help us open up that segment of the research cycle? For example, I know that there's an open tool for review of, of, uh, of proposals. Um, so, that could be something that you pick. So the directions, once again, are as follows. So we're gonna break out into groups. I'll give you folks eight minutes to 
really just do some Googling. I just want you to go out and see if you can find other examples of open segments of the research life cycle and put it into this uh, spreadsheet. And then we'll talk about what we found and each group can report. Any questions? Hi, I'm sorry, I kind of lost you there for a bit. Uh, could you please repeat the last steps that we're supposed to do? What did you want us to look up? Yeah, I just want you to look up, find like other um, examples online. Oh, so, okay. Of, yeah, and then just, and then um, on the link, and it, it's linked both in the slides and in the notepad, it'll link you to a spreadsheet where you can put what you found. Got it, thank you. Great. So I'll turn it back over to Irina or Yo to send each of the participants into a group. Yeah, so the rooms are open and we'll see you in eight minutes. Oh, still popping. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, we're almost at the end of our time together. I'm very impressed with what you found. Um, some of these I, I don't know, so I'm excited to to hear about them because I think this sounds like it's going to be a learning experience for myself as well. So here's what I propose: Why don't we, since we have four groups, um, I'll just go. Uh, I'll go backwards. So I'll go four, three, two, one, and I'll ask you um, to let me know uh, what you found. And it's okay if you didn't find anything either. If you were, if you were like, oh, we still need some more. We wanted more time to to find something. You could then tell me what's something. What's a part of the research lifecycle that you would want to open up? Um, in particular, if you didn't find anything um, as a group. So why don't we start with um, group four. Um, if somebody from group four wants to unmute themselves or if no one's comfortable unmuting themselves, put it in the chat and I can read it out. So group four, what did you find? Monica, I think we have three rooms this time. Oh, three rooms, okay. So group yes. four did not find anything. Um, group three. <laughs> Oh, hi. Hi, Mohammed. what'd you find? Um, so I wrote a few things there. Uh, there are some uh, websites that uh, contains the, you know, the RxIV, there's BioRxIV, MedxIV, and ARxIV. And uh, yeah. I did found some few tools uh, I don't know about, uh, like uh, Figshare and, uh, this sounds interesting, the DMP tool. I wrote that in the chat. I don't know if you could read them. No, I don't think we caught that. So if you want to put it in the in the spreadsheet, that would be great. Cause I don't think I know oh, about the, the, the oh, there, oh, I just saw it. There we go, DMP okay. tool, a tool to for researchers create data management plans. Yeah, that's super helpful, especially as, so a data management plan is basically a document that as a research group you create so that um, you tell your other collaborators how we're going to manage this data and like how, how we're going to, sh to share it. Um, and increasingly, a lot of funders of research, so whether that's your like national government that's giving out money or even private funders like charities are requiring you to put together a data management plan um, as part of the, the grant process so that if you get money from them, you have to put together a data management tool. So that's super helpful. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing, Mahad. Yeah. Um, perfect. How about uh, group number two? I guess I, I can, I can, we, you know, one of the things we noted is that in your presentation, Monica, you gave a lot of instances of places where you could store your data and share your data and have, uh, have a dialogue regarding it. Um, so uh, we kind of went over that. I, we didn't have enough time to go through those. Some of those I'd heard about and some of them I had not heard about. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things about this area that um, is a little bit confounding is that it seems very siloed. There's like if you, you yeah. put some data this place and some data another place, and then and then you have certain tools like Open Science Framework, which captures the whole process. Um, and, right. and so it's, it's kind of hard to work through, um, 
but you know, I guess the the link the linkage is through the digital object identifiers right. that you put in persistent identifiers, and so people can just click and link to where they need to go to 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 verify it. Right. Um, one of the things, and I, and I apologize to my group for monopolizing this, but I kind of went through my our website, uh, which is open access. Um, which where, where we'll take preprints. Um, we get preprint pre feeds from um, archive um, and from bioarchive um, and, and and other sources. And then we we're we're actually talking to a number of universities now that they all have their own repositories. Um, and we will take those uh, preprints and we break them down into different modalities. You know, so uh, different. The video summaries, pitches, if you will, yeah, or audio pitches. Um, and then mm -hmm. we have a section where people can interact with the researcher, leave comments, questions, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have an ability to connect you with related research papers and then to reach out to those researchers. So it's really kind yeah. of a crowdsource platform focused on the back end of your research process, which is right. the paper the final paper, the manuscript, if right. you will. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then we talked about how that could be applied into, into um, an area of interest for Anna, which was human rights abuses um, uh, and collect, you know, sourcing data. You have your conclusions about mm -hmm. how political regimes might affect, uh, you know, uh, human rights outcomes and, um, and sharing that kind of data. Yes, uh, super interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And I think what I want to pull out from uh, from that is the recognition that like each of the product projects that you are doing, it will be a part of this ecosystem, right? Like the the projects that we mentioned, for example, the the pre review project that that I helped uh, start was was a small project like yours at one point. That's now part of the larger like research and scholarly communication infrastructure. And that's what we're hoping to launch you into through this through this program is that you're gonna be one of these projects on this list um, and the recognition that the, the community is really big and, and is trying to uh, create innovation and new tools around um, opening up the research life cycle. Yeah, Danny I wanna is get, my... Yeah. Oh yeah, Danny's say, your- Yeah, yeah he's, she's my uh, mentor. Yeah. So we've right, been having a right. lot of discussions, yeah. That's perfect. Um, let's let's finish off with um, group one. Does anybody want to go from group one? I just think there's a couple here that like uh, are interesting. The citation gecko is is neat. Like I said, there's some of these that I don't know that I'm like excited to to like click the link and, and learn about. It's very cool. All right, if you want to put something in the chat, uh, let me know. Otherwise, um, maybe I'll go back to my presentation since we're almost out of time here. So the last thing I want to talk to you folks about um, is how do we give credit for everyone who participates in that research life cycle? I'm going to go back to the presentation. So yeah, giving credit. Um, I remember when I was doing, um, I was doing my undergrad degree and I helped collect all of this data for this master's student. And I even, you know, helped with ideas and asking questions and finding later on that I did not get like an authorship credit, even though I felt that like I had contributed to this research. And it's something that like, that happened like 15 years ago and that I still remember now. Um, research or the scientific process or the process by which, you know, that pathway to get to that final publication, as we talked about, is, uh, can, can sometimes be very circuitous. It has um, many different pieces and that involves many different people. This is no longer, science is not conducted by a single person anymore from the beginning to the end. It's not just some scientists in a corner of their ivory tower coming up with ideas and writing it down. It requires help and support 
from a lot of infrastructure um, and a lot of other people to help collect that data, to help think about those, you know, for thinking about that, that research life cycle again, to like come up with the hypothesis, to test the hypothesis, to collect the data, to analyze the data, to review the manuscript, um, to the desk that you sit at. And I think it's just really, the last thing I want to leave you with is to, to think about, you know, we've talked about the, that the research life cycle is, is winding and to think about how do we break the research life cycle into sort of these like constructs and think not only about how do we open up each of those segments, but to think about who contributed in each of those segments to get you to that final piece of that manuscript. And to think that, for you to think that not just because you're the one who came up with the idea um, that you should not be the sole author, that you should give credit to everyone who helped you get into that path, and, but to, to the end of the path of that publication. And to do it in, an, you know, in a sort of like a fair and equitable way so that people know the kind of contribution that you need to provide in order to get authorship. And so um, here I link to the uh, National Institutes of Health. It's the US uh, major U United States funder who has um, contribution guidelines so that you have in advance when you're at the ideation stage. So you, you might have your project proposal, your data management plan, as was brought up by Mohammed, but you also have your authorship contribution uh, requirements at the beginning, at the start of that pathway, at the start of the research life cycle, so that the people who are involved in the, in the work know the type of contribution that they have to provide or be involved in to get authorship. Um, when you spell that out really early on in the process at the beginning, it then makes it more fair and people then understand um, what the process is going to be like so that no one feels at the end that they contributed and didn't get the, um, the credit that they so deserved. Um, just thought I would leave you my email if you've got uh, any other questions. Like I said, I'm involved in peer review and then the open climate campaign is what I lead at Creative Commons. We're working to make all climate change research open. And I guess I'll turn it over to Ine for the uh, last five minutes or two and a half. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. I think this was an amazing presentation and um, you know, by understanding how the research, research life cycle works, you're also bringing together all of the concepts that we have been learning from the beginning. Um, and it's really nice seeing all of that put together. And hopefully for um, everyone participating here, it's also been like um, this experience of finally being able to join uh, and to put together all of those concepts. Um, so again, thank you, Monica, for being here. Please let us give Monica a round of applause um, as our expert this week. Yeah. And Thank you, folks. So we don't have much time for questions. If you do have questions, I encourage you to um, write them in the notepad, and then maybe Monica can go back and answer them. Um, you can also put questions in the Slack, and we will make sure that um, they get to Monica as well. So we have one minute left and I just wanted to uh, share um, another announcement very quickly that for the project presentations next week, we will have Malvika joining us. Um, Malvika is another co-director here in OLS. Um, yeah, Malvika, do you want to maybe introduce yourself very briefly? I'm very excited to hear from all of you and I'll introduce myself on Slack to save you some time. I'm very delighted to listen and had a chance to talk to some of you at the uh, coffee calls and look forward to meeting more. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining again.